This is the best moments of the Barbecue Central Show in 10 minutes or less. Ever wish you could re-listen to your favorite interview or segment? Do you enjoy hearing older shows for the first time in years? Then the best moments of the Barbecue Central Show in 10 minutes or less is just what you need. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the best moments of the Barbecue Central Show in 10 minutes or less. I'm your host, John Solberg. Today I'm taking you back to November 29th, 2011. Chad Ward of Whiskey Bent Barbecue is in. Chad just giving some insight on the world of competitive barbecue from a general level. We're going to hear from Chad in just a minute, but first let's hear from Chris Grove. Chris is a very renowned and prolific food blogger. His blog is Nibble Me This. All right, let's do it. The hotline bringing first timer into the show, food blogger Chris Grove from NibbleBeThis.com. Chris, how are you, buddy? Doing good. How about you tonight, Greg? I'm doing absolutely fabulous, Chris. Thanks for taking the time out to join me. And uh, I appreciate you. Uh, you know, first timer into the show, got to be very intimidating for uh, most people, but you are a professional food blogger out there. You know what time it is. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. You're really kind of one of the first uh, grilling food blogger guys that I've kind of brought into the mix uh, a little late into the live show game. So for the and quite frankly, Chris, and I know you would never say this in person, but you are a uh, chat room celebrity when it comes to the show, always giving out information. You're, I think, 95 percent of the time in the the show when it's happening live. So I certainly appreciate that. But for the folks that maybe don't know the story behind Chris Grove and what Nibble Me This is all about, uh, how is it something that you even get into? Where does the passion and the drive come from? Uh, Actually, it really started off as a goof, to be honest with you. I didn't really think it was going to go anywhere. It was just something that I thought would be fun to do. And, uh, you know, one day I started to get a comment here from somebody and a comment from somebody else. And I realized, oh, crap, people were actually reading this stuff. And, uh, (laughs) you know, decided I'd try to make it better. So that's basically how it started. It was really all on a lark. So when you start getting reaction and you realize you're going to have to start interacting with people and becoming a blogger in, uh, you know, for the real sense of the term, I mean, what's your background? Are you somebody that grew up around grilling and barbecue? Uh, Is it something you just kind of threw up there and all of a sudden you're forced to become an expert on the fly? How does that all work out? No, it really, you know, my uh, background really started with barbecue was when I was uh, probably in 04 or 03, I decided to try to make uh, barbecue like I'd had in North Carolina as a kid. And I just hadn't been able to find the same thing here or anywhere. And I, you know, went out and bought me a a Brinkman uh, offset smoker and tried to figure it out myself. And after banging my head on the, uh, you know, that process and learning a lot from the people in the forums, I thought I would just, you know, try to incorporate it in there too. So the longer you've done nibbledmethis.com, uh, the more recipes you've put out there, obviously you're garnering more and more track, uh, traffic each and every day to the site. Any kind of doors that it has opened up for you that you didn't even expect would happen as you keep it rolling? Oh, definitely. Um, probably the biggest thing is like information and access from different companies and vendors and things like that. Because, I mean, if I called them just say, hey, my name's Chris Grove, they're not going to call back. But you know, when you have a website and uh, now a lot of them come to me, you know, Food Network will send a thing saying, hey, we're looking for, you know, a food entrepreneur who has just left their job and trying something new. Um, things like that that I've never would have thought would just fall right in my lap. Um, you know, you get invitations to events. This year I got to go with uh, uh, Robin and uh, from GrillGirl.com and uh, uh, John Dawson from Patio Daddio over to uh, Kingsford University. I guarantee you Kingsford's not just going to call me out of the blue and say, hey, do you want to come over here? <laughs> so things like that, it's really I never expected. Chris Grove joining us here on the show. NibbleMeThis.com is his website. Go ahead and check it out if you haven't already. Um, when you're put in that position or when you're approached with uh, somebody asking you to evaluate a product or we want to give you this product or we want to take you over to Kingsford, you, is there any type of – professional decorum or rules that you have to follow like disclosures or anything like that to make sure that you are on the unbiased and and level playing field? Yeah. um, In uh, 2009, FDC FDC decided they were going to start really enforcing uh, what they call user endorsements because you had companies out there that would stick some flunky intern in a cubicle somewhere and said, here, write a blog about our company. 
Um, so now you have to, if basically the rule is if you get any kind of compensation, it doesn't just have to be cash. It could be, um, trips like the Kingsford university thing, um, free product, whatever. Could it be uh, Thai hookers? Uh, where would you get such a thing? Yeah. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> uh, Actually, when that when they did the video for that and it first came out, the, and they had the FTC video. I linked it on my site and uh, had to do a smart aleck disclosure and said I didn't get any sexual favors for this uh, post. Uh, <laughs> I thought it would be funny, but yeah, uh, you have to be upfront about it and state it in the post, either you know upfront, hey, Kingsford sent me to this, or put a disclaimer at the bottom that says, hey, I got free product. You can't just say, hey, this is great stuff, and and not. Uh, um, you know, explain why you know, that you got it for free. So, what's the difference between food bloggers and like what competition cooks do? Have you uh, gotten into competition at all? Do you ever have any type of uh, inkling or or want to get on the competition cooking scene? You know, I've, I've been to a lot of them, talked to a lot of them. It's way too hard for me to be honest with you. That is some hard stuff that they do. Um, you know, there's some similarities as far as, you know, we both take food seriously. We both have to try to appeal to an audience. Um, and with both of them, really, any fool can do either, but it takes a good skill set to do either well. Um, the biggest difference, I think, is freedom. You know, comp cooks have a lot of rules to follow depending what sanctioning body you're, you know, competing with today. Uh, you have set foods you have to cook, whereas, you know, we pretty much have bloggers have free reign. You know, we can do you know, what other methods, preparations, ingredients, whatever. Chris. And then there's there's also like schedule. That's a big another big thing is, you know, there's no clock running on me. And I guess the biggest thing is I get to do do-overs. If I screw up, I'm just not going to post it and I'll post, you know, do it the next day and repost it. <laughs> Chris Grove joining us here on the show. NibbleMeThis.com is the website. All right, now, uh, food bloggers known, obviously, for great recipes. Uh, I've asked John Dawson this question. Uh, it was probably three or four months ago. Actually, I, now that I'm thinking about it, it was probably almost a year ago that I'm actually thinking back to the conversation that I had. I said, you know, John, when I'm going down the aisles in the grocery store, I see products. I can't say that I've ever been inspired by seeing, like, one product, and all of a sudden my mind starts going, well, if I go here and I go here and I can do this and I can do that. I mean, that, like, happens to him all the time. I see it happen with Robin, uh, and I've seen after perusing your website, it obviously is happening with you. What what inspires you when you go into the grocery store? Are you starting out with some type of game plan or outline, or all of a sudden is the mood going to strike you as you're in, uh, you know, whether it be a specialty store or just a regular grocery store that you see a product and all of a sudden you can start feeling a new recipe getting generated within the, the Nibble Me This brand? Actually, honestly, one of the biggest inspirations is trying not to go to the store. Uh, <laughs> I'll do the refrigerator stare and sit there and try to figure out, okay, I got this leftover. I got this coming up that I need to use and just try to figure out what I can use to avoid that trip. But, uh, um, you know, really, if, if it's something that I'm doing for a project for somebody, I basically sit down with a whiteboard ahead of time and just start thinking, okay, what, what I'm thinking of, like, for example, bush beans, honey baked uh, beans. You know, I start thinking what the flavors are in them and, and try to match them. Uh, John Dawson actually gave me a, a great book, The Flavor Bible, and uh, that's great for trying to match things with certain ingredients. So I use that a lot. So I segue into the recipe question knowing that I'm easily going to be able to ask you about this pig candy cheeseburger that you did recently. Tell us about that <laughs> and, and like what the recipe would be in case people want to try it. Well, it, it's um, – I got the recipe up on my site, but basically what it is is um, it was one of the projects I was working on with uh, Bush Beans, actually, and uh, you know, it was supposed to be a tailgate. And unfortunately, at the last minute, we weren't going to be able to bring our grills onto the tailgate site. So we tried to, I, what I wanted to do is try to make something that was portable. So I'd already made the pig candy, which awesome on a hamburger. I don't know why I never thought of that before. That's, I mean, that right there makes it worth doing. But just did um, a beef patty. Uh, the pig candy and other beef patty. And then instead of bringing a whole bunch of ingredients, I put a whole bunch of ingredients into a cheese sauce and just pour that right over the burger on site, you know, put it in a thermos so it stays warm. And you pour that over your uh, already cooked burgers when you get there. So it's just a nice way to be able to transport it down to the uh, tailgate if you can't cook on site. Are you a burger snob? Do you like to make your own? Do you prefer this kind of meat over that kind of meat? How do you make them? Um, not really a snob. I like, um, uh, 80, 20 blend. Um, if I can, I'd uh, rather do it myself and use uh, just ground chuck. 
Um, I like doing uh, fatter burgers like uh, five and uh, five and a third ounce burgers. So it's about a third pound. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. Would you ever eat a Bubba burger? <laughs> <laughs> My brother-in-law actually works for them. No. <laughs> no! To put in your request for a future show, please contact John Solberg via email at john, J-O-N, at the bbqcentralshow.com. Chad Ward joining us here on the show. Chad, so let's talk about scores in general, whether it be KCBS, whether it be FBA. If you see a category start to fall off a bit, at what point do you start to make changes? And for you and the team, are they wholesale changes? Are they minor tweaks? How do you go about that whole process? It, it really depends on more of, of what we tasted. We will obviously take the judges' recommendations into account, but we really don't make wholesale changes unless a category has been just kind of failing, like pork did us last year. And so we, we did make some pretty big changes coming into this year, and and they paid off. But something like brisket, where we've had you know continued success, we've had a couple of contests where we could taste the difference. We're just going to make some small, subtle changes to to get that back on the right path. Now, Whiskey Ben isn't a, a veteran team by any stretch of the imagination, but you're not the young punks on the block anymore. What are some of the biggest things as a team that you've learned on the circuit that perhaps you didn't even think would be something you would have to contend with? Uh, quit bringing kegs to every contest. That was probably our biggest. We, we Bullshit. That's the best idea ever. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we did. I mean, for, for three years, I mean, every contest we, we brought a keg to, and, and we started to realize we could have just as much fun on a Friday night without all of that. Uh, I mean, we still drink, have a good time. Don't get me wrong. But what we learned was a couple of things. One is listen. Uh, we're pretty fortunate having a more recognized team that a lot of judges will come by, you know, before or usually after, you know, after judging. And, you know, you can talk and you can interact and, you know, take away the tidbits from there. You can also talk to a lot of fellow competitors you know, the, the, they'll, you know, obviously, you know, talk to you about some of the things they're trying, some of the things they're doing. So one thing is really just to listen more than you transmit, which for a guy like me is kind of hard. Now, I've always wondered about this because you have some of those teams that are out there. They're doing 25, 35, 40 competitions a year. And then you have some other guys that are just showing up. Maybe they're going to do it. Maybe this is the only contest they're going to cook during the course of the year. Maybe they're only doing a couple. They're guys that are bringing the kegs. Do, do you find a delineation now that you're kind of paying uh, closer attention to the teams and what they are doing in your doing your own recognizance with some of the top teams as you're being able to, to kind of talk to them prior to getting down to competition? Do you see the top teams that are always in an upper echelon of KCBS and FBA? Are these teams really not partying? Do you not see them partaking in a lot of adult beverages during the course of the evening? Is it always game time for them? No. I mean, I think if you take a, take a look at some of the, the top teams, you know, especially in the FBA, uh, let's, just, let's just run off a couple. Uh, Dana, uh, Dana Hillis from Big Papa's Country Kitchen, he, he had a great October cooked in. You know, Sam's Club Regional, Sam's Club National, the Royal, the Jack. D Dana will always be out there at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, and he'll have a beer with you. Um, good guy. We still have a lot of fun down here. Uh, Rub Bagby, which everybody knows, Swamp Boys Barbecue. R Rub's always out and apparent on a Friday night, and he'll have fun with you. Uh, Terry McKay, get her smoked. He'll win Team of the Year this year in FBA. You know, he'll, he'll be out there and have a good time with you. And we all, I, I think it's where you take that line from having a good time to just being stupid. And I think that's the line that, that kind of the, the guys that, that make better results, that's the one they can draw is everybody goes out there, they have a good time, they have a couple of adult cocktails, but you, you don't get to that point where you wake up an hour and a half late, two hours late to, to put on ribs. How quick is it to, to go over that line? Uh, it depends. I mean, if, you, if you're in the whiskey bent camp and <laughs> – and we're pouring back uh, shots of Palm Ridge Reserve, proud sponsor of Whiskey Bent Barbecue. Hello. The only the only micro distilled whiskey in the state of Florida. Well placed. You could probably cross. Yeah, you, you you could probably cross that line pretty quick. 
Um, but 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 I, I think it's all just in you know kind of knowing yourself and and knowing where you need to be and when you got to say all right boys that's enough we'll uh we'll continue this at at two o'clock tomorrow after brisket turn in. Jed, have you seen any big changes in flavor profiles and types of injections or techniques over the past two years that you have implemented now that you weren't using when you initially started out? Uh, not big ones. I, I would say I've uh, obviously not, not not to conflict with the show. We're we're big Cosmos Q guys, and I would say I'm actually probably injecting a little bit less. That than I used to in the past. I mean, still inject, still get the flavor down in there, but but really cognizant of the too beefy or too porky uh, type of comments. And you know, I, I would say there's there's not a lot of wholesale changes that, that that we've seen in the last year or two. I would say that I think there's a a lean back towards more smokier food uh, down here in the last three to six months, and and you're seeing some guys change styles based on that do you welcome the the change in flavor profile or seems to have been kind of a stymie in creativity when it comes to profiles over the last maybe two three years are do you foresee or are you forecasting uh, perhaps an even bigger more wide sweeping change in flavor profiles over the next year or so i i i think the judges continue to challenge us us cooks to layer flavors and whether that be layering flavors of smoke or depth of smoke and then you know rub and sauce flavors on top of that uh i i see the judges making us get a little more complex than cooking something on a pellet cooker for 12 hours and slathering it with blue zog um i I think they're challenging us a little bit more now than 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 that all right, one last question here, Chad, before we flip topics. You know, I've talked to a number of pit masters over the years. The vast percentage of these cooks have said that how they would cook their competition barbecue is completely different than what they would serve for their family and friends when it comes to the same uh, proteins of barbecue. If you're thinking about getting into the circuit, would you say it would be just wise to wholesale abandon the thoughts of your backyard barbecue and how you're making it when you're thinking about making that leap into the circuit in order to be successful? Yes, I, I think I, I cook a lot of the food the same for family or friends. I don't season them even close to the same. It is it it is a lot less sweet at home, and it's a little more spicy. And I would say if you're gonna really take a shot at going into competition cooking, take a class as soon as you can because you need to taste those flavor profiles. And there it is from November 29th, 2011. Chad Ward of Whiskey Bent Barbecue and Chris Grove of NibbleMeThis.com. If you want to hear the rest of this episode, there's a link in the show notes that will take you right to it. While you're over at the Barbecue Central, excuse me, while you're over at the BBQ Central Show.com, cruise around, check it out, check out the archives, hit the search, do a search, look for something you like. Leave me a comment. Leave some feedback. If you haven't done so, make sure you subscribe to the Barbecue Central Show via podcast. Never miss an episode of this show or that show again. Until next time on the best moments of the Barbecue Central Show in 10 minutes or less, I'm your host, John Solberg. I look forward to talking to you again soon.